Hello, uh, I'm Sabrina. I'm going to talk about MaxEC, which is encryption for wired LANs. Um, so I will start with an introduction to MaxEC, um, some definition, architecture, why you would want to use it. Then I will talk about the Linux kernel implementation, and I will then describe some future work that remains soon. Um, so first, what is MaxEC? Uh, it's an IEEE standard for encryption over Ethernet. And you can use it to encrypt and authenticate all traffic in the LAN using um, GCM AES with 128-bit keys. So why? Well, um, security within LANs is pretty bad. You can have rogue DHCP servers, rogue router advertisements, and you can. some people could do ARP and NDISC spoofing. And IPsec cannot protect you against that because it's only layer 3. So if you have an interested link, then you could be screwed. And additionally, uh, you could use MaxSec over VXLAN. So there is a proposal for encrypted VXLAN, but the encryption is done on the tunnel endpoints, not in the virtual machine. So if you're a cloud tenant, you don't have control over, your, over the keys. That's not what you want. With MaxSec over VXLAN, the encryption is done in the virtual machine, so the, you, not, you don't need to be aware of the underlay network, you just do your encryption on the Ethernet packet that you, that you transmit, and that's it. Uh, so, some introduction to MaxSec. Um, the main concepts in MaxSec are the secure channel, which is a unidirectional transmit channel from one node to many, to as many as you want. And it's covered by a uh, sequence of successive <coughs> overlapping secure association. The secure association within the channel um, is what, what is used to transmit every MaxSec frame. And the main parameter for the secure association are the packet number and the key. Uh, then the security entity is just the instance of the an instance of the MaxSec implementation, and it's linked to your transmit secure channel. You have one security entity for each transmit secure channel, but you could have many received channels. And the uncontrolled <coughs> port is in IEEE terminology the network interface provided the, providing the insecure service, and that's what you build MaxSec. <coughs> Um, so, you've probably heard of 802.1x. Uh, you have basically two options to configure MaxSec. The first one is that you configure your keys and your secure channels and everything manually. And you <coughs> find a way to do your key exchange between your different nodes, or your key setup between your different nodes. The other option is to use 802.1x with the <coughs> MaxSec key agreement protocol extension, which is defined in the 2010 revision of the standard, and that allows you to perform discovery of other MaxSec nodes and all the setup of secure channels and secure associations, key distribution between your nodes, and also synchronization of packet numbers for um, for replay protection. So MaxSec has two modes, two main modes. You will always have integrity and authenticity of your traffic, and Encryption is optional. So the default crypto suite is GCM AES. And the entire MaxSec packet starting from the Ethernet header, the source address and everything, will always be authenticated. And then the admin can decide whether he, they use encryption or not. So if you don't use encryption, the MaxSec packet is just passed as additional data to the cipher suite. Otherwise, the um, original payload starting from the Ether original ether type will be encrypted. On receive, you have several options for validation. Um, the first, the first option is that you just drop all packets that are not valid, or that you cannot verify because you don't have the key. That's the most secure option. And the other options are to accept invalid traffic, but you can count them as invalid and. Statistics. Uh, of course, encrypted traffic, encrypted frames cannot be accepted if you don't have the matching key. So you can only perform um, non-strict validation 
if the traffic is not uh, is not encrypted. <coughs> um, another option of MagSec is replay protection. So each frame is sent with a 32-bit packet number, and on receive you may choose to validate the packet number with the lowest packet that you expected. And you have a configurable configurable replay window, so some amount of reordering within your LAN is acceptable. So, quick look at the packet format for MaxX. First, um, an unprotected frame, and then when you want when you pass it through a MaxX device, uh, you will add the sec tag with the first the Max, you will change the ether type to the MaxX ether type, add a sec tag with a which is the MaxX header. And all the original payloads starting from the from the previous ether type will be protected by MaxSec. And then at the end, you add the ICV uh, for, from Krypton. If you decide to encrypt your traffic, everything starting from the user ether type is encrypted. So what's in the sec tag? Uh, you have the tag control information, which I will describe afterwards. Uh, then you have the association number, which is the ID for the secure association. You have um, length. Um, if, if the packet length was smaller than 64 bytes, then you have your packet number, which is used as part of the, um, as the IV for the cryptographic suite and also for replay protection. And optionally, you have the secure channel identifier for that frame. So the contents of the TCI are for the important, for the really interesting parts, the SC bit that indicates that the optional SCI was actually present, the E bit that indicates whether or not that frame, the payload was encrypted, and the C bit that tells you basically whether you can perform non-strict validation that I explained a bit earlier. So because you have some optional parameters that such as the, um, the ICV length for MaxEC is variable, so if you don't know the, um, if you don't use the default ICV length, you could not perform, you could not accept traffic that is not configured. Um, one possible interaction between MaxEC and other protocols is with VLANs. So if you receive, a, if you have a VLAN frame and you want to encrypt it with MaxEC, that's possible, and the VLAN header would also be covered with, by the by the site type. Of course, then you could also uh, transmit this frame through through another VLAN, but that VLAN header would not be protected by MaxSec afterwards. Uh, so, how is packet handling performed? Well, uh, on transmit, you will receive this frame from the stack. Um, what you do is you push a sec tag to the beginning, so between the Ethernet header and the data. You compute and append the ICV, maybe you encrypt your, your payload, and then you pass that frame down to the underlying device. On receive, so you get this same frame as you just transmitted, you start by verifying the packet format, then you check the packet number if you have enabled replay protection uh, from a security point of view, you just drop the packet to, you're not giving any feedback to any attacker. And this first uh, replay protection check helps you to defend against DOS attacks because you're not performing the cryptographic computation on something that you will just drop anyway afterwards. Uh, then you perform the cryptographic verification and you're, you decrypt the packet. Uh, then you have a second replay protection check because the packet might have been delayed going through crypto. And then you remove the ICV, the, the sec tag, and you pass this frame up the stack. So now we're going to look at the implementation in the Linux kernel. And um, first, the first idea that we had when implementing this was to use a kind of transparent mode in which we would configure MaxSec directly on the real net device. And so that all packets that go through the device are just transparently encrypted and decrypted, and you don't really have to care about MaxSec anyway. 
it just happens. Um, the advantage is that you don't have any additional net device. And it seemed easier from a configuration point of view. It looks like it would just work. Uh, another advantage is that the QDisk layer would see only the original packet and not the sec tag and not the encrypted payload and IP header and everything. <coughs> just see the normal packet. Um, but there are quite a few problems. Um, one serious problem would be that you would need hooks in packet processing path. So that would have been hard to get through, to get committed into the kernel. Um, it also makes it very hard to reject packets and receive that were not encrypted and you would need some hacks because you they would just go through the stack and not uh, get through maxite processing. And so these various hacks would have been pretty much unacceptable. Or you would have to let the user add some filtering rules manually, but that's pretty much not transparent anymore. Uh, TCP dumps capture, TCP dump captures also become quite messy because you would see both the encrypted and unencrypted traffic, and it's hard to handle VLANs and to use multiple transmit channels that would also have been quite difficult because so you can have multiple transmit channels on the same network, on the same net device, but to choose which transmit channel you would use, um, if you have a single upper, uh, interface in appearance, that's a lot more difficult. So the solution that we ended up implementing was the, uh, creating a new network device for each transmit channel on your real interface. So it works. It's it looks very similar to what VLANs or MAC VLANs do. You have a parent device that sees the uh, raw traffic, um, so the encrypted or protect or MAXEC protected packets, and also all your non-protected traffic, such as um, all the 802.1x traffic that you would maybe have. And if you want to have some non-protected normal LAN traffic, then that would also be on the parent device. And it also matches pretty well the controlled and uncontrolled port model that is used in the IEEE standards. And from the, yeah, it uses the RX handler and NGO start exmit option, um, functions, so pretty much pretty standard for net devices, uh, virtual devices. Um, on the so the crypto, we use the crypto kernel's crypto API, which provides all these nice authenticated encryption functions. Um, and we can also just use hardware acceleration, for example, ASNI, if it's available. Um, now let's have a look at the, what the MagSec implementation looks like from the, in a bit more detail. Um, you've got the struct MagSec device, which is the private data for MagSec. Uh, the, yeah, the MaxSec virtual net device. Um, the Sequoia parameters in the MaxSec Sequoia structure. And then you've got the um, transmit channel, which is also related to the security entity. And then um, you can have multiple receive secure, secure channels and all the secure channels can have um, secure associations with the keys and packet number. So the interaction between these data structures. If, so you have um, you have a linked list of all the received secure channels for the um, for each security entity, and for the master net device, you have a linked list of all the um, children MagSec devices. Um, the Eric Sender, which is also used by all the virtual net devices, um, performs the so it, I don't, uh, on when it's received when you get a MagSec frame, it will identify the um, secure channel to which this frame belongs. 
Um, if the SCI is not present in the SEC tag, it will be computed from the MAC address and, the, and using the default port number. Otherwise, if it's present, you just take it from the SEC tag. And you find the receive secure channel uh, from, the, from the master device. Um, then you use the crypto parameters that are related to this receive secure channel and you can then send the packet of the stack on the new on the MacSec net device. So as I said, replay protection is performed once before before crypto and once after crypto and then you can update your receive window. Um, so, on the, <coughs> when you have a packet to transmit, the, it's, it goes through the NDO start exmit function for the MaxSec net device. And since there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the MaxSec net device and the transmit secure channel, you just send the packet using the parameters, the crypto parameters for this net device for the MagSec net device and then you send it through the underlying real device. Um, so the configuration API for MagSec is split between RT Netlink for creating the, the MagSec net device and, configura and configuring all the parameters that are global to the net device and to so the security entity and GE Netlink um, to configure all the um, transmit secure associations and uh, receive secure association and receive secure channels. And uh, I use that because it provides a nice demultiplexing between all the commands for these, kinds, these different kinds of objects which RT Netlink doesn't provide and that allows a nicer API design. Um, if I have time. Okay. So I'm going to show you a few use, a few examples of use cases and how you can configure it with IP root. Um, first, you could have a basic LAN setup for MaxEgg. Um, if you have a switch that supports MaxEgg, then you could uh, configure MaxEgg to be terminated at the switch. Um, otherwise, if you have a switch that doesn't support MaxSec, you could just configure MaxSec between the hosts themselves. And that, that works with any switch, and the switch would see only MaxSec protected traffic. So if you don't trust your switch, that's the way to go. Um, so a simple configuration for a MaxSec link between host1 and host2. Um, would be just IP link add. So you had a MaxSec link on top of ETH0, and then you create your secure association for transmit using <coughs> the key, using a key that you have created yourself. Um, so IP MaxSec add MaxSec0 TXSA0 um, on to um, set it active, and then your initial packet number. Uh, then you would create the receive secure channel on that interface, on that MagSec interface, and create a secure association on, for receiving packets coming from host 2, so that the key here <coughs> on transmit would match this key on receive for the opposite node. And yeah, that uh, switch between, between the two. Um, when yeah, one thing is when you reach the end of the 32-bit um, packet number, you need to switch to a different secure association. The when the packet number would wrap, um, <coughs> the secure association disable it disables itself so that you don't reuse the same packet number with the same key. And when you have exhausted your secure association, you need to set up a new key, a new secure association with a new key, and then you can 
using this command, you can just switch to the next transmit secure association. Uh, if you want to enable encryption on on the link you have already created, you can just um, set encrypt on. <coughs> and you can do that at any time, just transparently while packets are going. Same with replay protection, with replay on and the window size that you want to use. Um, so you could configure multiple secure channels, then you for that you just have to create two separate MagSec net devices and to configure the secure channel on the other side. Um, yeah, I'm going to skip over that if we if you want. Um, you could also use MagSec with bonds, with bonding your teaming devices. Then you just have to um, put the MagSec net devices instead of the um, underlying link in, inside the bond. You add you add these MagSec devices to the bond and configure MagSec on each of the individual links. Um, for a VXLAN setup, you could just um, so you have this set up with two different um, two different cloud tenants A and B and suppose that uh, tenant A has a VXLAN tunnel for, for itself going through the underlying network and they could just create the, um, a MagSec channel for themselves and so the um, MagSec packet that the cloud tenant transmits would be this and then the cloud provider would add the encapsulation at the top, but they cannot do anything about the encryption. They cannot see the traffic that's, that the tenant has sent. So <clears throat> in conclusion, uh, what remains to be done? Uh, so first of all, MagSec has not yet been committed to the kernel, but I'm quite optimistic. Um, you have some optional features of MagSec are the confidentiality offset. So if you are if you are transmitting encrypted traffic, um, you could decide that you don't want the first 30 bytes of your packet to be encrypted. You could decide that, say, your IP header is transmitted in the clear, still integrity protected but not not encrypted. Uh, there's also a second cipher suite that has been that has been standardized using. 256-bit keys, <coughs> so I will work on that um, once the basic MagSec code has been accepted. Um, we've been talking about hardware offloading with some vendors, and that would help a lot with performance. We could reach 10 gig uh, line rate. And so for now, the performance of the basic MagSec implementation is not very good, but we will uh, work on improving that in the future. Uh, in user space, for now, I have only implemented um, IP root support, but we are looking forward to add a network manager support for configuration and to um, add WPA supplicant support. So WPA supplicant already has um, like key agreement protocol support, but we need to hook it up with the Netlink API so that it can configure the kernel and create the MagSec um, like devices. What's the current performance um, So I have only performed some very basic tests between two virtual machines running on my laptop. Um, and I had something like 300 megabits per second between the two VMs without doing any performance tuning whatsoever. Can you go back to your data structure? Is the data structure between ingress and egress here? Or is it different data structure? Uh, you share that secu What happens when a packet is both coming in and another one is going out? You can parallelize, right, on two different CPUs, or do you have to share the... No, no, no. Um, so the Keys are separate for transmit and receive, and the um, secure associations are separate also. 
Is the PN used to to encrypt every frame? The, uh, is, is, yeah. it, is it part of the keystream? The, uh, um, the PN is used as input to create the keystream that they that sort? Is that how it's it used as the as part of the um, IV for AES GCM. Why is it to use the uh, master in IP route two? When I see that in IP route two, in order to add a port, you do a link and port, and didn't change the master for the lower device, like you're doing in bridging and bonding and VLAN. Uh, it's more similar to a VLAN than to a bond device. So you point to the route. <coughs> if you have routing, you point it to this thing, not to. Yeah, you, you add your IP address to the MaxSec device and everything. Okay. Yep. So on the, this is the transparent versus, uh, I don't know what you call this, the net, the net device mode. It was mainly because of uh, it being inconvenient to get the transparent mode working. And mainly I must be also, all the Wi-Fi cases we have today, all of them are transparent. There's no new net there popping up when you do encryption. And the, all the <coughs> cases, I would assume, the real full offload. I mean, it's only be much cleaner if you only have a single net there. there. So, was there a spe were there specific reasons other than the how easy it's get to upstream implementation for using the multiple net there model? Um, it's not because um, on on Wi-Fi the the encryption is just the default mode of functioning. So is MaxSec for Ethernet. I, I, don't any, I don't see any difference between about uh, AE, one AE, and what Wi-Fi, WM, and CCMP does. It's an encryption of each frame. You know, in the, they are very similar on that function. At the time, I'm kind of surprised to see a completely different model for uh, Ethernet with MaxSec versus Wi-Fi with uh, uh, hardware acceleration. Because in both cases, it's going to be the network adapter. In practice, once you get to real line rate, that's going to be doing the encryption. It's not going to be some uh, upload, AES upload uh, uh, on the host side. Uh, you can have no. more than one MaxSec, let's say, on, the, on one interface. You can have multiple SS and Wi-Fi as well. It's multiple keys and still the encryption happens in the hardware. Yeah, but you, you can have multiple uh, channels to multiple different destinations. Yes, same, same with Wi-Fi. The routing table wants to distinguish between which channel you want to use. So you have uh, encryption to one host which uses like, which makes a distinction on the IP address level. And for, and for that to work with the routing table, you want to have multiple net devices. So you want to be doing that as an IP address uh, routing selector? Yeah. So for example, um, Sabrina, can you show the slide where you had like the switch and the two, um, no, the other one where you had like, yes. uh, yeah, this one exactly. So in this <coughs> scenario, for example, you make a split routing scenario where H4 could, for example, have a device route and can, can communicate with both H2 and H1. But for example, H1 and H2 cannot talk to each other. And you want to distinguish those scenarios over routing. But does that make sense? I mean, if you're doing IP routing, but your encryption is tied to the MAC address, how does that work together? How does it not work together? <laughs> if you're selecting the route based on the IP address, you already also know the MAC address. So you might as well select the security association based on the MAC address, because that's where the decryption is going to happen, based on the MAC address. It's not going to be based on the IP address. I, I don't think so, so whether you select your security association based on the IP address, well, that doesn't make any sense to me. You'd have to select it based on the destination I, MAC address. There's, in Linux, you can have many layers between you and routing, and in the driver that could make changes unbelievable. That could I don't think the MAC address would be guaranteed to be consistent after you select a route. Right, but, but then yeah, this doesn't yeah. work. So the security association is tied to the MAC address. MACSEC is link layer. This it has nothing to do with IP. That's why I'm very confused about IP address. It's actually not really used to the MAC address. You can configure yourself where, how, you, how and which channels you, just, um, um, you dispatch, to which crypto instance you dispatch pack, um, packets to. Yes, but the receiver is going to have to be a MAC address to make sense with this out of the security association. You can have multiple channels on the same MAC address. Sure, but you still... So we would select a port number based on the IP range? Yep. And the MAC address based on the ECRS MAC address? Can you can you bind multiple thereby essentially having <coughs> you know essentially using multicast like in this example if, if H4 needs to send to both H1 and H2? Yeah, you could have a channel that's 
You could have a channel from H4 uh, that's shared between H4 to sending for to both H1 and H2. Is that a single packet that would traverse both then, a, a la multicast, or, is it, or you're saying the, there would be multiple unicast packets? That's uh, going out of H4, that's one single packet. What is the, the, how does the broadcast domain work on this? Is every, every MaxTag SA is its own Ethernet segment? Or do you have one Ethernet segment that has different MaxTag SAs and they get mixed together? No, its channel is its own domain. Yeah. I think yeah. that from the key there is a, a, a group key and a private key. This is how they are doing that. That's, uh, that may answer my question. I was going to ask, how does IDV6 neighbor discovery work with multicast? Uh, it it BGT goes over the GPT, GPT key. Okay. Yeah, there's group key and private key. That, that's what they are doing for the broadcast. They're using different keys. And from where do you learn a group key? There's no. So that's the key that you configured there. I, I, I didn't see a group key. There's, there's no group key, it's just uh, from, for example, if you have. One channel going from H4 to both H1 and H2, would you just encrypt with this? With one key that both, both H1 and H2 can decrypt? Yes. What about multicast then? What's the same? When you multicast, you just have to, you can also put like all all systems in, <coughs> one, in one crypto domain when you have one broadcast channel, like in the slide before. That's just an alternative implementation which is possible to do, but we suspect that basically all people will just do the, we have one MaxSec equals one broadcast domain. And then you do like multicast like uh, it's done before. So you would put H1 through H4 all, all in one Fair. MaxSec domain. Yep. And, th and then if you chose to use multicast as a subset of that, you, you could do that. Yep. So, so this provides no authenticity because it's gonna be shared key. <coughs> no, it's, you have authenticity that you know that the packet was actually sent by H4. Yep. And then you could have, uh, H1 could have its, its own uh, transmit channel with its own AES, It's not public key. So, I mean, where does the, the, the integrity come from? So the integrity comes from its AEID, so you can verify that the packet comes from it. You did a key exchange before, so you either have like one-to-one um, -one relationships with multiple keys or end to m different keys. So if, of course, if you replicate the key to multiple peers, multiple peers, peers share one key, but it's, it's right. AES GCM. So GCM does H is kind of an HMAX, so it discards the frame. It can if it cannot validate the um, sender of the packet. Right. So if I have one max with H1, H2, and H4. Mm -hmm. Then I'm not going to be able to distinguish if, it, if the packet came from any of them. No, you have different keys for RX and TX. Ah, yeah. well, but I need to share them with the <coughs> so they cannot authenticate. No, uh, you cannot. If, if someone is trusted inside the MaxSec domain, this person is trusted. Okay, so I can't identify who sent the packet. Now you know that, they, yeah, you can't. I, I can identify, but then I can spoof because I have the key. If machine. you're inside the MaxSec domain, yes, and if yeah, the okay. MKA passed, and if you are. If you, for example, use 802.1x, um, you know that this person was allowed to access the switch, right. and with that you and basically trust it in some level, yes. And then you have like normal layer two within this domain, yes. It's not like secure neighbor discovery sent or something like that, yeah. where you have like end-to-end -end verification of neighbor discovery frames. No, that's not the case here. So in the key. Uh, uh, so I have a few questions, but four questions. Uh, the first one, uh, this is very similar to IPsec. I don't know if you looked in the, the implementation of IPsec. The history of IPsec had also two implementations, a transparent one and the net device one. And the net device one didn't go upstream. The transparent one is upstream. So I don't know if you looked into this history. Not the right. implementation because it's very similar also conceptually and implementation-wise. Uh, so maybe you should look into that. Uh, it's a comment only, it's not a question. Uh, the next one is, uh, is also a comment. Uh, the Alex handle you use for the implementation, there's a problem that uh, it could get oversubscribed. Like if you have two uh, modules using an Alex handle. Yeah, you, you can only, only have one system. at a time. Yeah, so it's a problem for 
protocols with anything that uses the other channel. But that doesn't happen if you stack. It doesn't happen until it happens, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah, but then at the moment, then. Yeah, yeah, then yeah, yeah sorry, yeah, yeah, it's the time. Sure. Okay. And your first question is like you are on layer two domain, like you have a monitor.